Good morning, everyone. I begin today by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. For those online, good morning. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I would also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in our seminar today. This morning's speaker is Dr. Carmine Wayman, and he will be presenting Understanding the Interplay between Basin Architecture, Depositional Environments and Sediment Pathways in the Cooper Basin, Implications for Identifying Prospective Plays. He will showcase new results from the late Carboniferous to mid-Triassic Cooper Basin that challenge existing notions on its evolution, new insights on sediment dispersal pathways and consequently its resource potential. Dr. Wayman holds an MSc in Geology from the University of Southampton and a PhD in Geosciences from the University of Adelaide. He joined Geoscience Australia in November 2021 as a Basin Analyst in the Strategic Basin section in the Advice, Investment, Attraction and Analysis branch of the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division. Carmine has over nine years of industry and research experience, both in Australia and the UK, and he participated in the International Ocean Discovery Program Expedition 369 in late 2017, investigating Australian Cretaceous climate and, technology and tectonics, and Carmine is a fellow of the Geological Society of London. Please welcome Carmine to the podium. So I don't need any more further introduction. So yeah, thank you for coming to my talk today and I hope you enjoy the next 14 minutes where I'll be showcasing my research which I undertook during my grant funded um, tenure at the University of Adelaide under the supervision of Peter McCabe. So I thought I'd make it a bit more interactive before I start my talk today. This is a good excuse to get your phones out and share your views. So I want you to try to give that a minute or so. I want to share with everyone both in room and online what thoughts come to mind when you think the word Cooper Basin? Because I'd be interested to see what people think. I think there's kind of old idea to kind of hang around but I'm just interested to see what everyone thinks both online and the room. What comes to mind when they hear this word? This is the mood board. So actually, as once people get their um, kind of thoughts up on the board, it should come up on here. Okay, I've got a few coming through now. So yeah, I think one of the classic ones people think of when the, when the coop basin comes to mind is oil and gas, because it is Australia's biggest onshore petroleum province. Permian, yes, is a very classic locality where Permian strata is preserved. Yeah, mature and overlooked place. Yes, that's a very key one. Lots of industry are, despite being a mature basin, are still finding little prospects which are profitable for their operations. Maybe a few more minutes. Lots of coal. Definitely, I think some of the coals which are in the coop basin are extremely exciting. Some are more than 30 metres thick without any classics in between besides the odd maybe volcanic ash bed, which I'll discuss a bit later in my talk. Yeah, again, again, resources, resources, resources. And not just in terms of just the conventionals, but the unconventionals, and also future hydrogen storage and carbon capture and utilisation. I'll just give another minute. Get a few more views, points of view on the board. I'm also happy to share images as well. This um, pad it does also share images. And yes, I think the probably the key one like to, to highlight there is probably yes, it is indeed complex. I think once you start delving beneath the surface, pardon the pun, is indeed it has a lot going on, just not just in time, but in, but in space. So cool. So let's move on back to my presentation. So 
So I guess the question, the main question is, why did I choose a Kuhu Basin? I think kind of ignoring the obvious, there is a, an assumption amongst many geologists in Australia who consider the Kuhu Basin as a job well done. Um, of course, like I, I hear quite often, it's like we know everything we need to know about the basin. And yes, that's kind of true to some extent, just from the abundance of data available and the, and the well-established ideas in the basin. However, you need to delve into the literature to see how understudied it is, despite being a mature petroleum province. And as a comparison, the North Sea, a basin of sim similar maturity, has around 10 times as many publications as compared to the Kuhu Basin. I'd also like to point out that despite being a, a review paper being published last year on the Kuhu and Manga Basin, which had a more of a focus on the structural geology, kind of the last comprehensive review of the Kuhu Basin was undertaken when I was a little baby, when I was six years old, still at primary school. Um, the North Sea, in comparison, is, crit is critically assessed on a regular basis, with review papers coming out every few years. So if you look on the publication called Cross-Border Themes in Petroleum Geology, released, uh, I think it was earlier this year, each of those points represents an open point source of data from exploration and appraisal wells, which is all available for everyone to study and analyse. So before I delve into my talk, I'll quickly explain my methodology. So I took a multidisciplinary approach, something which is not kind of unheard of these days, which incorporated high-precision high CA TIMS dates, carbon isotopes, core data, legacy 2D seismic, and wireline logs. Also, I specifically focused on the patch wire formation due to its resource potential. I further integrated these data sets with 1D bat stripping and GA data sets from the Kuhu Basin GBA program. A selection of sites and areas of interest are shown in this figure to your left. So the dotted lines where the cross sections I used and each of the dots is a well I use for my, for my work where I had core or for backstripping analysis. So one of the first things I noticed when I inspected cores from the patch bore formation was the presence of tough, or some people call tough beds, interbeds between the coals. No one's ever reported such a lithology in the basin before. To me, it made sense to date them to better constrain the age of this unit which is currently determined by low resolution and uncalibrated spore pollen zones. On the right hand side are two examples of sample tough beds embedded in coals that did indeed yield zircon grains. Um, one example from the Shifra core, right in the Wiener trough, southwest corner of the Kuhu Basin, and from the Hazan one well in the deepest part of the Patchwire trough in the northern part of the Kuhu Basin, both on the South Australian side. As I was unsure about the suitability of these zircons for dating, they were initially screened using a low resolution technique called LAICPMS, which is error margins of about plus or minus five or six million years. This was, this, was help, this was undertaken to help discriminate between older and younger zircon grains. Thus, this would increase the possibility of dating younger, of dating younger grains using the c 18 methodology, and thus determine the age of tough deposition um, um, using these grains. This works on the rationale that a sedimentary bed cannot be older than its youngest zircon green. Out of 11 tasks processed for zircons and screen using LA ICP mess, but also looked at visually using CL images, six, six samples yielded grains suitable enough for high precision uranium lead CA TIM stating. It's a bit of a mouthful. We need to know is that it's a very high precision dating technique because error margins are about plus or minus 40,000 years. And here are a section of my results. So just be aware that there is no X axis on this plot, just focus on the Y. So what you have is individual samples grouped together, and with those samples, you've got the grains. So you have the black grain, the boxes are black. These are the grains which were used to calculate the mean, the mean weighted age. Those in white, are interpreted as being detrital and have not been used to determine, to determine the age of the, of the sample. So you've got a wide, quite a wide range of dates going from about 285 million years to 277 million years. These dates would initially indicate that deposition occurred mostly in the Kungurian stage of the early Permian. 
from a first glance. However, we can make some inferences if we extrapolate the data using the, some simple statistics. This figure shows a linear regression plot showing dates against the relative stratigraphic level of information as calculated by the percentage of information that lies below each of the dated tough bits. Using linear regression, we can estimate how much time is represented by the patch of wire formation. Thus, we can infer that deposition can occur mostly between Artisian and Kungurian periods, as opposed to between the Sakmarian and Kungurian periods, as suggested by panoceography. So a lot younger than people and over a shorter time range compared to previous studies. So why do these dates matter? I think this is a very important question. I think the first point is that these dates highlight that the sakmarian kungurian boundary is likely preserved in one of the thick 30 meter coals, notably in a Lishifra core. A prominent negative isotope excursion is known to be present during this, isotope, during this time period. I want to give praise to Amelia Orchard, who, is an on, who was an honor student at the University of Adelaide, who sampled and measured uh, carbon-13 isotopes, so carbon isotopes from 101 samples over 30 meters, about one sample every 30 centimeters, to test whether this, to test this hypothesis, whether this event is preserved in this in this coal. So to get a bit of context, similar negative isotope excursions have been noted in coeval coals across the world. An example here in the center from the Mozart Basin in Southern Africa, and another example from Southern China. And you can see they're very distinct, just pick up this point here, a very distinctive negative isotope excursion. Small, but present. Here's our, here's Millie's Orchard's work showing indeed the very prominent negative isotope excursion preserved in the thick coal at the Shifra 1. Of course, it got precise dates. This excursion doesn't quite occur on the on the established artistic concurrent boundary, just above it. So what does this so the question is um, what is the cause of this excursion? Well, it's, it's still a bit unknown, but one of the more hypo popular hypotheses out there is that there was a destabilization of methane clathrates on the seabed, releasing a huge amount of organic car um, carbon-12 into the atmosphere, possibly due to global warming. And it's kind of similar to what you see during the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. But again, what the cause of this event is still needs a bit more further study. Secondly, it also highlights that coals, or then back then peats, were going to accumulate at the transition between ice house and greenhouse periods. More interestingly, you can see that you've got uninterrupted coal accumulation over 30 meters. So there's an idea here that once greenhouse conditions were established, there was no significant variation in precipitation or temperatures, allowing peat to accumulate very slowly for at least six million years of that interruption. I mean, that is kind of unheard of. If you backtrack that from today back into the past, that is to when the Mediterranean last dried up. Imagine that ten of time just continuous peak deposition. And interesting, there's no modern analog for this. So also we are going to be dating to more tufts from the same coal bed to kind of better understand this process and whether it does indeed reflect six million years of continuous peak accumulation. So going to my next topic, I'll be exploring the link between tectonism and basin architecture. The tectonic setting in the Cooper Basin is complex, as people have mentioned on that mood board a little bit earlier on the presentation. And this is because it formed in an interplate setting far in board of any plate margin during this time frame. A variety of tectonic regions have been proposed throughout the years and quite a wide, quite a wide range of different tectonic settings indeed, from anything from intercrotonic to strike slip through to contractional. And I think GA's interpretation by Lisa Hall, who interpreted the basin as being a polyphase basin, we have phases of thermal substance intertwined with contractional extensional events over 100 million years, probably the best interpretation we have today. But even then, there's still a little bit of uncertainty about this interpretation. I think there's other things that you know you're a thousand kilometers away from any active margin, such on the east coast. At that time, this would be on the east coast of Australia 
or Gondwana, where the Bowen Basin is. The fact that the Creed Basin is underlain and overlain by basins, which is quite unusual. And also you have a range, you have um, several narrow elongate ridges across the basin. And the question is, were there always topographic highs during, during the lifetime of the Kuf Basin? And furthermore, some of the stratigraphic relationships in the basin still remain a little bit uncertain, mainly due to the um, uncarburated spore pollen zones and their absolute extremes against the geological time scale. So to better understand um, the te techno stratigraphic evolution of the Kuhu Basin, I use 2D seismic lane lines to reinterpret seismic horizons, faults, and to understand both to understand the stratigraphic relationships. But I did this in two-way time because I only had limited time to achieve my goals. So I interpreted five key horizons to get a rough gauge of uh, the techno stratigraphy of the basin. And for this talk, and to keep up to time, I'll only focus on a few key horizons to highlight key interpretations. The basis of my interpretations make use of flattening horizons and removing overlying strata to gain a qualitative feel for the basin architecture at the time of deposition. So I'm going to start from oldest, going through to the youngest. So we start by looking at what the Kuhu Basin may have looked like during the Kungurian, back in the early Permian, when the Patchwara Formation, seen with the top surface seen here in orange, was being deposited. We can see in the troughs divergent horizons with onlap only onto the basin margins. This implies that the troughs subsided faster in comparison to the basin margins. The ridges, roughly seen here, only experience minor uplift in elevated or faulted regions. Furthermore, you can see how the Patchwara Formation abrupts or truncates against the GMI ridge seen here. But also more interesting, you can see how the horizons run parallel to the basin, to the basement, um, which suggests that sediments did not infill any existing paleotopography. There's, an, there's a notion out there that the basin was entirely carved up by glaciers. Um, indeed, the nucleus cross-section, indeed, that's possibly unlikely to be the case. The Darling the unconformity is evident from the truncation of pre tilachi strata, such as seen, I'll show you a better slide in a minute. You kind of see here where the underlying strata get, are curved up and truncated into a blue surface. Um, and this is um, evident from truncation of, of these strata against ridges. And during Talachi times, seen here between the orange and blue lines, you can see how sedimentation rates then kind of exceeded base substance rates from the on-lap of strata against the basin margins, widespread deposition, and the infilling of basin relief. So you can see that during Patchwara times, substance was coming was greater than sedimentation, whereas it's the kind of reverse is true for Tulachi times. The same is true for the overlying Mathemary group, as seen here in red. Of note is stratigraphic architecture of Jurassic and Cretaceous units below the Cadenary formation seen here in Cyan. Thick, uniform packages are parallel across the entire expanse of the Kuhu Basin and beyond, suggesting uniform substance rates that match those sedimentation rates across the basin. And probably the key takeaway here is of note is how a GMI ridge continues to uplift by small, only by small amounts during the Permian, Triassic, and through the periods, with most uplift only occurring after the mid-Cretaceous event. So you kind of see here in, this, in the present day interpretation. So again, I'm going to go through the same thing, but a little bit further to the north, northeast. Again, you've got similar trends and geometries for both Tapachuara and Talachi times, but a little bit more uplift on the ridges. You can see quite clearly how much substance occurred in that Mary trough here, just after the, the, the patch of formation was deposited during the times uh, during the times when the Rosenheath, Epsilon, and Mercury formations were being deposited. 
huge amounts of substance. And also you can see here that the Mercury Ridge was likely a topographic high, whereas the Gigi Alpha Ridge was just slightly covered by the latter, by the patch of formation during latter stages of deposition. And likewise, you see the same pattern again for both the Nahmeri and the Jurassic and Cretaceous units. And of note, the relationship of the Kuf Basin units against stru structural highs and how they came less prominent as tropographic features through time. So to kind of bring a little bit more of a numerical context, there's, there's some quick sub tectonic substance calculations to figure out what rates, what kind of rates were happening from the start to the finish. So I think I'll make a particular note is that the te tectonic substance rate between the bridges and the troughs are very similar, but abide at different rates. So faster in the troughs compared to the ridges. The Aramanga Basin did subsidize more quickly when compared to the Kuf Basin, although these numbers are slightly skewed due to the elevate, due to elevated substance when the winter formation was being deposited. Substance rates were greatest during the deposition of the patch wire formation, the iron formation, and of course, as I said before, the winter formation. And using unconformity data from Lisa Hall study, uplift was most prominent on the ridges with negligible impact in the deeper parts of the basin. So what can we take away from these major results? So all these features would suggest that the Kuf Basin has a stratigraphic architect has a stratigraphic architecture that is consistent of a failed rift. And hopefully I'll we'll demonstrate to you a little bit later that pre-rift, syn rift, and post-rift architectures have been identified across the basin. So to kind of give you context of what I'm trying to get across here. We need to go delve back into what kind of rift basins look like. So rifts evolve in extensional settings, leading to formation of downfaulted depressions called gravens. These are bound by raised fault blocks on either side called horths. However, half gravens are more common with a depression bounded by a single fault, leading to wedge-like geometries commonly seen in the seismic cross sections, which I've shown you just before. This architecture strongly influences sedimentation patterns and ultimately where depression environments occur through time. More importantly, climate and substance also play a strong role in how depression environments change through time and in terms of whether number one, a lake or an axis river dominates along the axis, the axis of the basin or whether lakes form. However, majority of rifts do fail to develop into sleeveful spreading, with elacogens commonly forming, or that wherever, or, or otherwise, or alternatively, the rift axis just jumps elsewhere to another location. So an excellent analog to, to compare this to is the East African rift, as seen here in these Google Earth images. So you've got a very prominent fault scarp and lakes. And likewise, you can see you've got the, all the great African lakes all aligned along the rift axis of this um, through, through this region. And in this location, the African plate is in the process of splitting it apart into two plates called Somali plate and the Nubian plate. In many parts of the East African rift, many deep lakes form parallel to fault, fault scarps. You have a series of you have a series of small rivers draining into these lakes. And then at the top, you generally have a river which, which drains these um, lakes out. In this case, this is the River Nile, which flows out to the north. These lakes are also well now for petroleum resources due to the rapid, quick accumulation sediment and formation of source rock kitchen, which happens very early on during the early phases of deposition. Also, let's compare it to the Gulf of Suez, which is also a very modern rift, also kind of related to the East African rift. Um, and I also believe that some of the Kuf Basin architectures are similar to what you see in the Gulf of Suez, which consists of, of a series of half gravel structures on a deep side and a major curvilinear fault, um, normal districts, uh, and a major 
have linear normal, normal list report system on the shallow side. And as this basin is formed more in the low latitudes, you generally get the formation of vaporites as opposed to peat accumulation. And the last example I want to bring your attention is obviously the North Sea Basin, which formed during the Devonian with deposition continuing on to the present day. Again, you're kind of seeing those similar pre-rift post and post-rift geometries across the basin. And if these structures, which still continue to have a huge influence on basin configuration, as you see today, and then through time, especially from the Jurassic through the present day, what you see is, is that the sediment that the structure becomes gradually drowned out by sediments before evolving to a wide saucer shaped basin where the sin rift features finally come arrays over a course of about 70 million years. So then now we've got a better understanding of the tectonic set in the basin. What does it then mean for depth environments and resources? And for this, I'm going to particularly focus on the Pachamara formation. So with a new tectonic setting in mind, we need to consider how this would have influenced where things are. And one of the common analogues people compare the Pachamara formation to, this is a very kind of embedded idea people have in their heads, is that of the river Orb in Siberia, as seen here from the air. It's being compared to the Pachamara formation because it was, it's a very cold environment. It formed at high latitude. And also it's for the peat books. However, when one inspects core from the patch for formation, two things are readily apparent. The first is how the rocks, how varied the rocks are, both in space and in time. Secondly, is how few indicators there are for terrestrial conditions in some parts of the base, some parts of the basin. This is especially the case in the deep part, in the deeper depth centers, including the Wiener and the Patchwara Trough. Features which, I've, which I have seen which are particularly lacking in some parts are include roots, palisades, and desiccation features. And here's a few meta sections. I'll zoom into uh, a section of this in a sec. So basically, you have lithology, grain size, and sedimentary structures. So, in the case of the Shifra 1, we need to the majority of the core from this unit is fine grained in character and host a variety of sedimentary structures, including heterolithic bedding, wave ripples, and thinly laminated siltstones and claystones. And here's a zoomed in image cross section of this measure section. Also, there's also evidence for drop stones, so you've got some granules and pebbles in a fine grain matrix. However, in our parts of the basin, such as the Makita embayment, so going towards the South, the South Australian Queensland border, on the southern side of the basin, uh, you see much more coarser grain succession, as seen here from the section from the Tark One Well. Succession consists of sandstones with cross beds and river cross lamination. That transition to thin beds are laminated to wavy siltstones, or thin sandstone beds with climbing ripples. And again, here's a zoomed in image of that meta section. So I'll be able to highlight to you that. This formation looks very different when you go from one part of the basin to the other. And because everyone likes pretty pictures of pretty rocks, here's a few snippets of key faces which I've identified. So you go think from your classic cross beds through to wavy bedding and some streaky bedding, valves, drop stones, cinerites, and yes, there are some root structures preserved in the patchwork formation but they're very few and far between, and are very poorly developed. You're going to have to look into carboniferous, carboniferous strata over in Europe to see how big roots can be. They can be the width of your hand going through 10 centimeters of strata. So in the big context of things, we need to propose a new definitional model. So work is still ongoing to try and refine this. What I'm proposing is that the center of the troughs um, at least during times of lacustrine high stands, that as probably that the proof basin consisted of one or more lacustrine complexes fed by glacially fed rivers. And assuming that the Musgrave province was highland was 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 um, exposed and expressed as highlands during this time frame to the northwest, 
it was likely these were the glaciers were about 200 kilometers away from the basin margin. These were the likely waxed and waned in response to a combination of possibly Milankovitch cycles and long-term climate change. I'd like to kind of delve in to more detail about the coals, but again, that's a whole lengthy talk for another day. But the coals present, present in the Cooper Basin were most likely, um, at the time of deposition, floating peat mats, which covered long, large parts of the basin for long periods of time with possibly um, sediment undercurrents flowing underneath these peat mats into the parts of the basin. So kind of coming on to the end of my talk, we need to understand how these tectonic, both the different environments and tectonic setting impacted sediment dispersal patterns during this time frame. So these are the list of considerations, which I kind of highlighted to you throughout my talk. I think from a tectonic setting, so bunts of coal and climate. Also, I need to take into consideration that in some parts of the basin, there is indeed very poor well control, especially in some parts of the Mary Trough. So these are some of the GBA maps, which I've used to kind of base my new interpretations on. So you've got depth to the top surface, thickness, sand isolates, and coal isolates. And this is an example from the patch for our formation. Again, for the REM, but especially from the Epsilon Formation and Slarchy. So I need to kind of compare these three environment, these three units to see how different environments change as the Cooper Basin evolved through time. So just keep in mind that these are still under construction. Um, obviously, I'm trying to do this working full time, well, working full time at GA, but I'm getting there slowly but surely. So to capture these three page reconstructions. I try to capture how the pale geography is intrinsically tied to basin tectonics. So keep in mind that the maps you see here are very representative due to the amount of time they captured. I think you have to look at human time scales to see how things like the Magdalena River in um, South America changes in human lifetimes, rivers taking changing course due to the impact of things like El Nino. So the blues, the, so everything in yellow represents where maybe rivers flowing into the basin. The greens representing where there may be light greens representing where there's coals and the blues representing where there may be lakes with the browns representing where there may have been highs. So during patch wire times, when else during the Sinrif phase, the castrine sediments dominate the deeper parts of the half graves and troughs, whereas the fluvial and more thick coals developed more in the basin margins. And during times when sediment supply exceeded the rate of the creation of accommodation, rivers developed, rivers may have developed in the centre of the basin and flowed parallel to the back axis margin. But during most of the time during the patch of raw formation, sediments have been trapped, especially the coarser grain, being more trapped on the edges. During REM times, you can just see how the basin just subsided and the whole thing came a big massive lake. But more interestingly, which I wish I completed, but, but hopefully you can, you can gauge what I'm trying to portray here is that once you reach the post rift phase, most of the lakes disappear, with the rivers even crossing these ridges, which suggests that rivers were starting to flow parallel to the deepest part of the basin, are flowing along structure. So why do these results matter? Because this is because understanding tectonics and different environments impacts the resource potential of any basin, not just the Cooper Aramanga basin. And because we're, in, we're interpreting more the castrine systems as opposed to fluvial systems, especially for the patch of water formation, we, there's some major considerations we should take into account, including tectonic setting, the geometry and architecture of ancient lakes, and the resulting stacking patterns. And here are some key points which I've highlighted in this slide. However, the impact of these factors, especially for the growing CC US industry, that to be highlighted, and this is just all in some early interpretations, is that the clustering reservoirs tend to be often stacked and often host numerous baffles and barriers and baffles to flow, especially in between individual sand units. And this is because this is a function of lake level fluctuation. And in risk settings, the best sandstones are associated with nearshore. Near shore, deltaic and subaqueous fans. However, 
these sentences may have limited error or extent. We, times where you may get more sandstone um, extensive sandstone deposition may result when lake level falls. We get the reworking of erosion of sandstones from the more up dip areas down to the low dip areas during the Castrine um, low stands. So to kind of wrap up my talk, uh, the four key points that I'd like to try and take away today is that there is a complex array of different environments for the patch wire formation in space and in time. With geometries, a stratigraphic architecture, very similar, these reminiscent of many failed rift basins across the world, both today and in the past. And also that stratigraphic architecture substance rates do very highly, do very highly variable across the basin, especially between the ridges and in the troughs. And the isolation and connectivity of troughs may explain the distribution of different environments and sediment transport pathways through time. Let's wrap up by thanking the following people for helping me do my research. We started in mid about mid 2019 and continue to the present day. So thank you very much. <laughs>